In this last video on the climate change chapter, I want to talk about policy responses. Now, the general policy response to any kind of pollution problem would be a pollution tax, a marketable permit, uh, marketable permit scheme, or a command and control in the same kind of ways that we studied in earlier chapters. So here I want to concentrate more on what uh, specific comments related to global climate change. The first point is perhaps obvious, but I think I wanted to state it anyway. Uh, in terms of the vulnerability of a country to climate change and the resilience, which is in some sense the opposite of vulnerability, the wealth of a country certainly plays a role as well as its biophysical environment. So a small low-lying island country is going to be extremely vulnerable regardless of how rich or poor it is. But in many other uh, cu countries, h how well the people in those countries are going to fare in the light of the coming uh, climate change is going to depend on whether the country itself is rich or poor. It's uh, easier for a rich country like the U.S. to relocate large numbers of people and and an infrastructure like buildings than it is a poor country. The policy options are also rather obvious, but let's just state them. The first one is not to do anything, uh, so-called wait and see. The second one, and I'm reading from page 274, or getting these from page 274, the second one is kind of unusual. The book calls it No Regrets. What this means is there might be some situations in which the current situation isn't optimal because firms don't completely understand all the possibilities of current technology. So if firms are doing things which actually aren't maximizing their own profit right now, then you, you might be able to suggest things to firms where there would be a win-win situation, where they would both help in climate change and increase firm profits. I've discussed this in an earlier video. It's, of course, possible that the neoclassical assumption that firms understand everything about technology is false and that there are these unexploited win-win opportunities. It's not clear to me that there are very many unexploited win-win opportunities that would make a big difference in terms of global warming. And then the, the final op policy option is to decrease emissions. So next, what have previous cost-benefit analyses said about global warming? Well, in the early 1990s, I already mentioned the, the contrast between the conclusions of Nordhaus and Klein. Your book also points to a study by Ayers and Walter. I actually don't know much about Walter, but um, Ayers has been an environmental economist uh, working in France for a very long time. And in box 19.4, the book uh, clarifies uh, how different the conclusion of Nordhaus was from the conclusion of Klein, whose conclusions were similar to Ayers and Walter. Basically, uh, Nordhaus, throughout his entire career, has taken a much more, um, well, I'll say optimistic view of climate change, that climate change is not going to pose large economic costs, and that therefore you don't have to do, it's not a, it would not be a good idea to do a lot in order to alleviate climate change. Uh, bringing that to the 2010s, you had, again, uh, Nordhaus working on elaborations of the models that he started in the early 1990s, versus Nicholas Stern, a British economist who was not an environmental economist, but was was uh, partially because he didn't have any particular preconceptions about this, was asked by Prime Minister Tony Blair, British Prime Minister Tony Blair, to investigate both sides of the climate change debate and then write a report about it. And his report, called The Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change, written in 2006, uh, it came out quite strongly in favor of lots of policy actions to avoid uh, climate change disruptions, which Stern thought were going to be quite intense, quite serious, quite damaging. 
Now, Stern was a well-respected neoclassical, is a well-respected neoclassical economist. Like I said, his background wasn't in environmental economics, but he he was quite well respected in the in the fields that he worked in, and so there was a natural question that was raised in the mind of economists: How come Nordhaus and Stern came to such very different conclusions? And there's a fairly large literature on this a debate, but most people seem to agree that one of the biggest reasons was because they chose a different discount rate. Nordhaus decided to use a market discount rate and Stern decided to use a discount rate based on the ethical position that future generations uh, are, are worth just about as much as current generations. So Stern pretty clearly says that the decision of a discount rate is an ethical decision. Nordhaus pretends that it's not an ethical decision, that you can just look up the discount rate in the Wall Street Journal and use it, the, a market discount rate in the Wall Street Journal, and, and you use it. And, and as we've seen before, if you use a high discount rate, then you're much less likely to take costly actions in the present that are going to help future generations. So Stern uses a low discount rate, therefore the welfare of future generations is quite important in his model, and these future generations Stern thinks are going to be uh, hurt very badly by climate change, and therefore in Stern's model it makes a lot of sense to take actions now, even though they are costly for the current generation, in order to protect future generations. Whereas Nordhaus's model uses a high discount rate, so the damages of future generations are going to suffer are not particularly important. And therefore they don't justify us incurring lots of costs right now. There are also differences in terms of how in terms of the magnitude of costs that Nordhaus versus Stern think future generations are going to suffer. So the difference in discount rate isn't the only difference, but it's one of the most important differences. I want to mention something else about um, uh, Nordhaus. I, I, I said in, a, in an earlier video that he won the Nobel Prize, and so I wanted to point out um, that this is controversial. So you can see the URL here, uh, foreignpolicy.com. Uh, Foreign Policy uh, Magazine is a pretty well-respected magazine that usually deals with issues of foreign relations. And here's a December 2018 article, the Nobel Prize for Climate Catastrophe. The economist William Nordhaus will receive his profession's highest honor for research on global warming that's been hugely influential and entirely misguided. And if we go beyond the photograph, I just wanted to read the first two uh, paragraphs here. Many people were thrilled when they heard that the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics this year went to William Nordhaus of Yale University, a man known for his work on climate change. Finally, the economics profession is giving climate the attention it deserves, just as the world is waking up to the severity of our ecological emergency. Media outlets have taken this as a positive narrative and run with it. But while Nordhaus may be revered among economists, climate scientists and ecologists have a very different opinion of his legacy. In fact, many believe that the failure of the world's governments to pursue aggressive climate action over the past few decades is in large part due to arguments that Nordhaus has advanced. So I am not one of those economists who is a fan of Nordhaus's work. Uh, I, I think that the scientific assumptions he's making, the environmental assumptions he's making are flawed, and there are also uh, problems with the assumption he makes about the distinction between economic growth and the benefits that humans get from the environment. As we've seen this semester, the the things that humans get from the environment is is part of what adds to people's utility and commodities produced by the economy also it's true do add to people's utility but there's no reason why one of those should take precedence over the other uh, let me go on though um, and just make a comment as of 2019 I write the main European Union model 
to describe climate change still assumes that climate change will not affect the economy's production function. We had a speaker from the United Kingdom in the economics department in the fall semester of 2019 who is an expert on the European Union's climate change models and uh, and and this is this is the, the model that he was describing. Actually there's a typo here. I meant the main European Union, so EU, not EEU. Let me change that right now. Alright, so I changed that reference right there. International meetings and agreements. There have been a whole series of international meetings organized by the United Nations starting in the early 1990s. Some of these lead to agreements, others lead to plans for future agreements. The first major agreement about climate change was the Kyoto Protocol, which was signed, but didn't go into effect. It was signed in 1997. I've discussed the Kyoto Protocol when we were talking about cap and trade and the, the fact that the Kyoto Protocol having a cap and trade mechanism in it uh, is is what caused the protocol to actually become popular in Russia and go into effect. So I won't repeat that. Let me just um, add a few more details that I, I may not have mentioned before. The, the protocol failed in the United States Senate by a vote of 95 to nothing in 1997. This was at a time when Bill Clinton was president and Al Gore who was very interested in climate change and went on to share a Nobel Prize concerning climate change with the IPCC. Al Gore was Vice President of the United States. Nevertheless, they couldn't convince uh, any senators, even any Democratic senators, to support the Kyoto Protocol. Al Gore himself had gone to Kyoto in Japan and had helped to negotiate the final text of the protocol. So, as we discussed earlier, it went into effect upon Russia's ratification in November 2004 uh, because Russia was convinced that the tradable permit mechanism would enable it to sell permits and make money off of those permits because its pollution had fallen since the early 1990s because of the collapse of the Soviet Union. The precise technical requirement for the protocol to go into effect, I've quoted here that you needed at least 55 countries representing at least 55% of 1990 carbon emissions to ratify the treaty before it went into effect. And as I said earlier, without Russia this would not have gone into effect because the US was not going to sign on. In terms of development since the year 2010, Japan and Canada have since withdrawn from the protocol. It, an argument can be made that Canada joined the protocol because it never thought the protocol would actually go into effect. It figured that Russia and the US were not going to sign, and so Canada could sign and make itself look environmentally friendly, but the protocol would never go into effect, and so Canada would never actually have to abide by the protocol. When Russia signed, and the protocol went into effect, Canada immediately got into trouble because it, Canada produces a lot of oil and gas and is a very natural resource intensive economy. And uh, eventually a conservative government took power in Canada and withdrew from the Kyoto Protocol. Japan, which is where the Kyoto Protocol was, was signed, Kyoto is a, a former capital city of Japan, uh, Japan withdrew from the protocol after the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster when a tsunami hit the nuclear power plant and caused a meltdown. Japan responded by shutting down, uh, I was going to say all of its nuclear power plants. Some of them are currently operating, some of them are not. It's not completely clear what the future of the nuclear industry is in Japan, but there have certainly been times when no nuclear power plants were operating at all, and the Japanese have become quite wary about nuclear power. The only way for Japan to make up for the loss of electricity generated by nuclear power was to increase its its, uh, its fossil fuel emissions. I, I shouldn't have said the only way. Japan could have started to lean much more heavily on renewables like solar and wind, but the Japanese government didn't do that. So J Japan is not going to meet its Kyoto Protocol 
commitments, and so it withdrew from the protocol. But lots of other countries, particularly European countries, are still in it, and they have uh, they engage in these uh, cap and trade uh, markets. Now, the Kyoto Protocol did not include developing countries, so it didn't have any sort of limits on emissions from China or India because those countries had constituted such a small amount of the, of the greenhouse gases that were in the atmosphere in 1990. Uh, finally, let me just quickly discuss the Paris Accords of just a few years ago. Uh, it was under the Obama administration that the Paris Accords were signed. As I wrote, uh, 196 countries in the year 2016 signed by 189 countries as of February 2020, but not Iran or Turkey, and the United States under Donald Trump is pulling out. The Kyoto Protocol was a somewhat standard pollution control regime where each country had a certain quota that they had to adhere to. The Paris Accords are quite different. The Paris Accords are basically a collection of voluntary pledges. Some countries chose to pledge that they were going to do a lot to combat climate change. Other countries chose to pledge that they weren't going to do very much to combat climate change. And there was no attempt in the there's no attempt in the Paris Accords to to make this even or to make it fair uh, between countries. It's just it's just a collection of voluntary pledges. So in that sense, the Paris Accords are quite different than standard pollution control agreements. Still, the Trump administration thought that the Obama administration had overpromised that um, that the Obama administration uh, had promised to do things that the Trump administration doesn't want to do, and that's the reason why the U.S. is pulling out of the Paris Accords.